It is an honor to be here, and uh, I greatly appreciate you asking us to be here. That means a lot to us, and I know the, the kind of caliber of people that you have, and to be amongst those people is humbling, and uh, a lot of times you don't understand why, <laughs> uh, but you know, we are very blessed to be here, and already blessed to feel God's presence in the service yeah. and feel Him moving. And that is a wonderful thing indeed, uh, to be in the presence of Almighty God. And so I have two messages that I am trying to figure out. One is more of a pastor appreciation message, and the other one, which I'm leaning kind of more towards, is uh, not necessarily what you would call a theme message uh, for that, but I think that might be where the Lord would have us to be. And so... We'll be in two separate places, and we'll flip-flop back and forth between um, 1 Samuel uh, 19 and Joshua 2. If you could uh, mark those places, we'll be going back and forth. We'll be in 1 Samuel 19 first, and then going to Joshua, and then going back and forth. <clears throat> uh, we appreciate greatly your prayer support and financial support as we are on deputation to reach the country of England and in particular the city of Newcastle, England. I got to go over at the end of May, early June of this year to meet with a potential sponsor and that went well and uh, got to have some interesting interactions with the English people. And I would love to, to go into those and tell you all about that maybe uh, when we're eating. Uh, I tell you, I'm not that hungry, so y'all need to pray that I get hungry real quick uh, so that the message doesn't drag on. No, I'm, I'm not very long-winded at all, so I don't, I don't see us being here very long. Uh, but it's interesting how that people can start off very similarly and end up in two complete different places, right? Maybe you've seen this in your own personal life. Uh, maybe it's a family member. You grew up in the same home, and one of you ended up doing this, and the other ended up doing that. Uh, but spiritually speaking, we see this a lot of times in our own life. We see this a lot of times in other people's lives and how that we can start and probably most of us have had the same starting point. Uh, I say that roughly speaking. We, we're in the Bible Belt. We're in the country. Uh, all of us have pretty much grown up in, in the same circumstances. Uh, all of us have probably gone through valleys uh, of depth that... A lot of people might not understand. I see some gray heads. I see some fresh heads. I see, uh, you know, but 50 years, a couple of generations is nothing in, in the grand scheme of, of things. And so most of us have, have pretty much started out the same way, but it's not so much important how we start, uh, but it's paramount important of, of how we finish. And we're getting ready to look at two ladies that when we find them, they're starting out the same exact way, in the same exact circumstances. But we find that one ends up going and, and being used of God in something absolutely monumental, while on the other hand, the, the other lady fades off into obscurity. And so I don't know about you, but I know which one I want to be. But it's about the choices that we make. Not so much how we start, but the choices every single day will determine how we finish. So let's look at 1 Samuel 19.12. We'll read a verse and then we'll read a verse in Joshua. 1 Samuel 19. And verse number 12. It says, So, and... I'm going to say, I call this name Michelle, okay? Now, I've heard it pronounced Michelle. I've heard it pronounced Michael. They're both wrong. Uh, 
the way you pronounce it is actually mihau, but I can't do that all day. Okay, I, I, I can do it one time, and I just exhausted that right then. And so if y'all don't mind, I'm just going to call her Michelle, okay, because I, that just sounds nice, and it goes off the tongue well. Verse 12, so Michelle let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Michelle lets David out through a window. She saves his life. Look at over at Joshua chapter 2, verse 15. Here we find a lady named Rahab. And let's see what Rahab is doing. Joshua 2, 15, it says, Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. So Rahab is letting down some spies through the window and she saves their life. Now these instances are very, very similar. There's two women letting men down through windows. If we look a little before, we see there are two wicked kings trying to kill these individuals. King Saul is trying to kill David and the king of Jericho is trying to kill the spies. But then there comes some very big changes between Michelle and Rahab. Let's look back over at 1 Samuel. We'll be ping-ponging this thing for a while. Look at verse 13. Let's see what Michelle does after she lets David out through the window. And Michelle took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's, goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michelle, Why hast thou deceived me so, and sent away mine enemy, that he has escaped? And Michelle answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go, why should I kill thee? After Michelle lets David out of the window, she concocts this scheme about David threatening to kill her and puts an idol in the bed. <clears throat> Whenever we are relying upon ourselves to fix the problems of life, there's no telling what we will come up with. I cannot help you get out of your storm, and honestly, I can't even help myself get out of my own storms. That there's one who even the winds and water obey. And that's the one that Michelle should have been clinging to. Let's look at this bed for just a moment. And see if we can apply something to our own lives. That bed is a secret place, right? There's only two people that should be familiar with that bed. And that is David and Michelle. But she defiles that secret place with an idol. And here we see this is a private display of falsity. Too many people, I believe personally, in the church have idols hidden in the secret places of their hearts. That idol, I want you to pay attention, was a counterfeit of her groom. That idol resembled David. But as we find, the men knew that the idol was not him. And so those men, they knew who David was. They had been around David. They had heard the song sung about David. They remember him doing great and mighty things. And so once they got close enough, they realized, hey, that's not David. And so many times in churches all across this country, there are people, and maybe sometimes even ourselves, we try to counterfeit God. We try to counterfeit the groom, yeah. our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and counterfeit him in our hearts, counterfeit him in our lives. And can I tell you something? Uh, it's easy to fool people who have never been around him. It's easy to fool those who have never been, ever had an experience with the groom. But those who know him and have handled him and been around him and they know what it's like to feel him come up close and they know what it's like to hear his still small voice and they know what it's like to feel him pass by their way. They know, hey, that's not the groom. So many times we can try to fool ourselves and we can try to fool others. But when you've had an experience, you've had a, an experience with God, yes. there's no counterfeiting that. No, there's, not. there's nothing that can take the place 
of the groom. Amen. We see here that Michelle is trying to do something that should not have been done. Are you trying to fool someone this morning? We all have it in us, don't we? Just because I am a preacher does not mean that I don't have to fight this. We cannot fool God. Now that idol, it was not alive, was it? It was dead, it was cold, and it was lifeless. Now, only you can answer this question. But does what you have on the inside, is it cold, dead, or lifeless? Now, if, if you're lost, the remedy to that and the reasoning behind that is because you do not know the groom. You do not know Jesus Christ. You've never been saved. You've never accepted Him as your Savior. And that is why that you are cold and dead and lifeless. Because every man and woman and child has a craving inside of their soul to be at one with their Maker. Everybody has it. And so you have a longing to be reconciled to God and have that closeness and that oneness. And nothing else can feel that. Not a relationship, not a bottle, not something you ingest. Nothing can take the place of the relationship with God. And so you're cold and dead and lifeless on the inside, but it's because that you are dead. You are cold and you are lifeless. Now, if you are a Christian and you feel cold and dead and lifeless, now that is a whole other set of problems, right? That's right. That needs a, another different remedy. We don't believe that you can get born again and again and again, right? right. And so it's a one-time, one-done uh, one deal kind of thing. But if you're here and you're a Christian and you feel that way, then you have another problem. And can I tell you something? I get this way. There are days when I, in, on my insides, I have nothing stirring me. I do not want to tell anybody about him. I do not want to pick up a Bible and read it. And I do not want to pray. And I feel cold and dead and lifeless. And do you know why a lot of times that happens to me is? It's because that I have stopped focusing on him. And I started focusing on everybody else. Because that is where our problems start. Is when we take our eyes off of God. And we start putting our eyes on everything and everybody and every circumstance and situation that life throws at our way. And that is when we become cold and dead and lifeless as a Christian. Now, if you feel that way, you have to do something about that. I can't get you saved. There's nothing I can do to save you. So if you're lost, you need to get saved. You need to accept Christ as your Savior. If you're saved and you feel that way, there's still nothing I can do to help you. There's no magic word. There's not a wand to wave over you. But there's an old-fashioned altar that you can come down, kneel your head down, kneel your heart down, and pray and ask God to give you the victory over that. That is what the remedy to that problem is. But we see that Michelle never does anything to help herself. And that a lot of times is how the church is. We see that we have problems. We know that things aren't right. But for whatever reason, we never do anything to fix the problem. And we come day after day and service after service. And we sit in a pew and we hear somebody preach. And we listen to the songs being sung. And day after day that turns into year after year and decade after decade, we realize that we've been the same for years and years and years. And we're not growing. We're not getting closer to him. And in fact, as time goes on, you get more miserable and more miserable and more miserable. And Michelle never does anything about it. Michelle starts lying to cover up what she did. Let's see what Rahab's doing. 
Let's check on Sister Rahab over here in Joshua. <coughs> let's look back. Now let's look at chapter 2, 18. It says, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. Look at 21. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. After Michelle lets down David through the window, she starts lying, trying to cover up what she did. After Rahab lets the men down through the window, she takes the scarlet thread and binds it around everything that she owns. This wasn't private. This was a public display of her faith. She wasn't playing games. She knew who? And what she was. Uh -huh. And she knew who and what God is. Yeah. And she told the spies exactly what was going to happen. Let's look back at verse number 8. And before they were laid down, she came up to them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token and that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brother, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. There's no counterfeiting the real God. There's no other way to be saved. And Rahab knew this. Rahab was clinging to that scarlet thread. The same God who saved Rahab from the falling walls of Jericho is the same God that can save a lost sinner from hell today. And while Michelle is lying to, to Saul, Rahab is confessing to the spies. And when you have idols in the secret places of your heart, we do a lot of lying to try to cover up after ourselves. But whenever that you come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, there's a lot of confessing. There's a lot of telling Him just how good that He is. There's a lot of telling others about how good that He is. We won't be lying to King Saul saying David threatened to kill us to save our skin, but we'll be telling the spies, yeah, we know God is coming. He's a big God and we're a wicked people. And do you think maybe that He could spare there's somebody like me. I'm glad that salvation is free to all who believe. Too many people are like Michelle and they are relying upon their own strengths and upon their own mind and upon their own cognitivity. But, but Rahab is just relying on the scarlet thread, the blood of God. Michelle's life seems to revolve around windows. Look at 2 Samuel. We'll just go here quick and then we'll, we'll come back. Look at 2 Samuel 6. Look at verse number 12. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him. Because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, let's look and see where Michelle is. Michelle, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Look down at 23. Therefore Michelle, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. David is bringing the ark of God back to Jerusalem. Now, the ark of God is the very presence of God, and that's important. And we find that Michelle becomes jealous. That's what it boils down to. She becomes jealous 
of how David is acting and the relationship that David has with God and with this ark. Now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Why in the world would somebody be jealous of God? Right? But can I tell you, whenever you distance yourself from God, you start doing a lot of things that don't make sense. Whenever you have distanced yourself from God, whenever you have not fixed those spiritual problems that you have and they keep accumulating over time, you start doing some really weird things. You start being jealous of the presence of God. You start being jealous of other people. And things like this play in your mind. Why in the world is God blessing them? Why is God doing this for, for them over here? Why is God blessing uh, this church? Why do they have all of this and we have this? Why am I living in this and they're living in that? Why do I have this to eat and they're eating that? Can I tell you, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, we're supposed to rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. Now that makes sense. Yes. Scripturally, that is what we are told to do. That whenever we are not relying upon God and we're not clinging to Jesus Christ, we start becoming jealous, we start becoming angry. And can I tell you, there's a, a, a saying that misery loves company, right? Uh -huh. Can I tell you what loves company even more than misery? Sin. Sin. And all of a sudden, you're doing things that you thought you'd never do. Not only that, but you want everybody else to do them. So you start calling everybody and texting everybody and posting things and doing this and doing that. Am I okay? Things that don't make any sense. But they make sense to you at that time. Because you are not right with God. We've all done stuff like that. That's right. yeah. Every single one of us. That we look back on and we think, Lord have mercy. That doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would I have said that? Why in the world would I have acted like that? Why in the world would I have done that? Right. Why? Because we were away from God. That's right. Right. Can I tell you something? And this might... Anybody is capable of doing anything. Anybody. The person you're looking at, people I'm looking at. Say, I would never do fill in the blank. The right circumstances, the right motives, the right pressures, you would be ashamed, and I would be ashamed. To see what we would do without God sheltering us and the Holy Spirit directing us. You look at Peter. Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus, trying to behead the man ready to die, ready to do whatever was asked of him to save Jesus Christ, right? He said, I'll go with you to death. And I think that he proved that in that moment that he was willing to try to kill a Roman soldier. You know what the penalty for killing a Roman soldier was? Playing patty cake. I don't think so. You would be crucified as soon as they had a free cross. You know why he was willing to do that? Maybe he had some messed up motives, but he was willing to do that because this is how close he was to Jesus. That's right. You know what happened that very night? The Bible says he followed from afar. And the same man that was willing to cut somebody's head off for Jesus and die is the same man that says, you know what? I don't know him. Leave me alone. I'm just here. There's this coincidence. I've never seen him. I've never been around him. I don't know him. Leave me alone. And let me warm by this fire. For heaven's sake. Same man. In the span of a few hours. Doesn't make sense, does it? Bipolar? away from God. That's right. 
How close are you to God this morning? How close were you a year ago? How close were you when your first child was born? How close was you, were you, whenever you started that, that job? We should be growing, right? We should be closer than we were last year. When we had that first child. When we started that new job. We should be different. Are you? Or are you different in a different way? I remember when I was closer. I remember when I enjoyed things a lot more than I do now. I remember when things used to mean something whenever I would open up God's word or pray. Distancing yourself from God will always end in disaster. What's Rahab doing? Look at Joshua chapter 6. You think Rahab is going to distance herself from God? Look at Rahab, or excuse me, look at Joshua chapter 6, 22, verse 22. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman. And all that she hath, as, she, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Look over at 25. <coughs> and Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. Because she hid the messengers which Joshua was sent to spy out Jericho. We see that after she gets saved out of Jericho, she just decides to follow God. She knows that there's nothing behind her to go back to. None of them back at Jericho quite took care of her like God has. She wasn't jealous of God's presence. She just wanted to be with God's people. Time has a funny way of playing tricks on our mind. We see it with the children of Israel. Do you remember the leeks of Egypt? Oh, remember those leeks? Remember the food that we had? Oh my goodness, it was so nice back in Egypt. But now we've been brought out here. And it's manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. It's all we ever get. Just manna, stinking manna again. Wish we had all that food that we had. Why were they out there to begin with? Because they cried out to God about how horrible their bondage was. And they begged God to do something and intervene. Please free us from Egypt. See, they've killed our children. They're starving us to death. But over time, their view of Egypt changed. A lot of times that happens to us as well, doesn't it? Oh, remember the old times? You know, we could kick back on a Friday night and enjoy a few. And you didn't have to worry about all. You didn't have to Saturday go party. You didn't have to wake up early and go to church. Remember, remember those good old times? Used to go out fishing. And, you know, all, and all the people we used to chase and all that. Remember those good old times? You know why that you're here. You know why that you got saved? Because one day, your life was so awful, 
home. And you knew that there had to be something better than what you have. Yep. And you got down. And somebody at that right moment came by your way and told you about Jesus Christ. And you said, you know what? I need somebody. I want to trust him. Some of us, our Jericho, the walls were so big, there was no way that you could do anything about them, right? That's right. You had tried to dig under. You had tried to drill through. You have tried to climb over. But you could not do anything to get out of your Jericho. You know why Rahab didn't stick around? There wasn't anything to go back to. That's right. And if there was, she wouldn't have stayed. Jericho had used and abused her. And sped her back out. And you know what sin had done to you? It had used and abused you. You were a slave to sin. You were under its control and authority. You did what it wanted you to do. Day in and day out. And it was ruining your life. And it was killing you. And it was ruining your family's life. And one day you got saved. And the Jericho walls were put down so low that you didn't have to even step over them. You got to walk out in victory. Yeah. What's happening to Rahab? Not be here this morning. Maybe you're lost. I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe there's somebody here who's lost. And you're thinking, is it really that better out of Jericho? Is it really that much better? I've been in Jericho my whole life. I know Jericho. I look out and I can see what it's like for other people outside of Jericho. But is it all what it's cracked up to be? Is the grass truly greener outside of these walls? Can I tell you a little story? I'm almost done. God has given us so much. Think about all the big things that we entrust to him. Think about our salvation, which is the hugest thing. Think about who we marry, our spouse. Think about our kids. Think about our jobs. Those are huge things. You know what's a small thing? Mountain Dew. That's a small thing, right? I try to tell this whenever I can. My favorite drink is Mountain Dew. I'm sure somebody, at least one person would say, man, come on. <laughs> That's a Presbyterian. <laughs> now let me get a little more personal, okay? It's not just Mountain Dew. It's Mountain Dew... 20th anniversary Baja Blast <laughs> Laguna Lemonade. Okay? Now the Baja Blast, eh, it's all right. But the Laguna Beach, I have beach to it. There's no beach on the can, but you have to put it in there. It just sounds nice. The Laguna Lemonade, it's mango lemonade. It's Mountain Dew flavor. Okay? like baby angels came down, <laughs> bottled summer, and then put it on a shelf for me to buy a few pills. Wonderful. But just when you start to like something, what happens to it? They take it away. And then you go, and you're looking at an empty shelf where it once was. And you're standing there salivating, waiting for it to just pop into existence. But it's not there. And then you go to Walmart and food country, and food city, and even Dollar General, praise the Lord, even went there. And guess what? Nobody had it. It was even sold out on Amazon. <laughs> you know something's wrong when it's sold out. Amazon can bring stuff back from the dead, okay? 
at cemetery style. And so I went through withdrawals for a little while, you know, you know, tried not to get a lot of road rage and stuff without it. And then I accepted that I would never be able to enjoy the sweet rush of the mango lemonade in my palate again. And so as I was coming to terms with that, I <clears throat> got called and a preacher friend of mine, preacher Blevins over in Sugar Grove, Virginia, he was having a homecoming and he asked if I could preach it. I said, I'm sorry, I'm preaching over here and I've got to go to North Carolina that evening. And he said, well, the place in the morning wasn't too far away. He said, well, why don't, after you're done preaching in the morning, come over here and eat with me. And I liked talking to Preacher Blevins, and I liked fried chicken. And so it was a win-win situation. And so I'm like, yep, yeah, sure, I'll come over. And so got done preaching, drove over there. Preacher Blevins has a friend that works for Mountain Dew. You know that? And I didn't either. And whenever this individual, this angelic being, whoever that he is, I don't know his name, but he, if I do, I'd probably name a child after him. <laughs> whenever he has a surplus of things and just, I don't know, maybe it got a little crooked or it doesn't look, you know, the way that it should or something like that, and it's, it's, he's not going to die or anything, it's good, it's good to drink. But whenever he, it doesn't, he has a surplus or whatever, he donates those beverages to the church, Okay. And so I, you don't know what they have because all of, the, all of the pop goes into a special pop closet. And, you know, they could have stuff back there from who knows when. But you don't see it. For whatever reason, the pop closet was full homecoming morning. And so I was sitting at this table eating fried chicken. And right here... Mountain Dew, Baja Blast, Laguna Lemonade. I left that church with two cases, hallelujah. That's 48 bottles, people. Okay, not cans. I'm talking about bottles. I didn't steal them either. They gave them to me. My wife told me I, I need to start telling people they actually gave them to me. I didn't just walk over and take a bunch and, and leave. And I still have some of those bottles. I didn't drink them all that first day getting ready to preach her uh, it's Sunday coming up we'll see if I can get some more on this <laughs> say why in the world would you tell that is it truly as good as everybody says it is I don't need Mountain Dew that is not a need. That's not a need for me to survive, right? That's just something that I like. That's something I enjoy. You know how many hands that Mountain Dew had to pass through to get to me? You know how many hours and days that thing to get to that church where I could get the... Who do you think did that? I think it's just coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. Good or bad. The same God that hung every star in the sky, the same God makes this planet the way that it is, which is amazing to think about how far it is from the sun and all the different orbits and things that are way above my pay grade. The same God that did all of that and that could put all of that on the tip of his finger and spin it if he wanted to. It's the same God that knows my favorite drink. Now that not, might not excite you, but when it's your Mountain Dew, when it's your uh, lady talked to me the other day about a cabinet. She needed a cabinet. She had a cabinet that she wanted. She had one in her house, and guess what? She got the same exact one was given to her through different circumstances. Whatever it is, whether it's a Mountain Dew or a cabinet, it's great knowing that we have a God that is powerful enough to do everything big in our lives, to save us, 
to give us the spouse that he wants us to have, to give us the children and protect the children and give us the job that he wants to have. But that's not all that God is. He's the big God, but he's also a personal God. Is it really that good to be saved? Is it really that good to have all of these things? Can I tell you? It is. Because the same God that does all of that knows you. He knows every hair upon your head. He knows what you like. He knows what you don't like. And the reason that he gave me those Mountain Dews isn't because that I need them, but because he loves me enough and he knows that it makes me happy. And he says, you know what, son? You can't get any of these, but I'm going to give you some. Just here, take 48 bottles. That's the kind of God that we get to serve. Isn't that crazy? That's absolutely insane to think that an almighty being that dwells somewhere in outer space, and I say that term loosely, I don't think you could ever get there, but you know what I mean, cares enough about the individual person that he gives us something just because he wants it. Can I tell you what's on my Christmas list? I don't need anything. Amen. I have everything that I need. I have most everything that I want. Amen. I can't think of anything that's want. Isn't that crazy? It's love. It's the kind of love that he has for us. Rahab, I'm not going to read it, I'll tell you, marries a man named Salmon. Popular baby names, <laughs> what is it, three, four thousand B.C., Sal Sal Salmon, Salmon, how are we going to do this? It's funny how that, you know, there are popular baby names through different generations. I went to church with like four Zachs, uh, John was popular, uh, a generation or two ago. Um, as you're reading through the Bible, you also see those names reappear. And so I find it's very odd that you look and, you know, it's like Methusael or something. It's like popular baby name of that generation was that name. It's just so weird. And they're real people. Rahab. Michelle becomes barren. Rahab, if I'm not mistaken, she becomes the great-great-grandmother of King David and the 29th great-grandmother of Christ. God chose her. you think it would have been Michelle, wouldn't you? That makes sense, to pick the princess. To have come through her. But instead he picks a Gentile lady of the night. Because she just loved him. And wanted to be around him. And around his people. Every time that she's mentioned, Joshua, what does he call her? Go to the Watts house. And Joshua saved Rahab the what alive? Harlot. Harlot. Do you know whenever in Matthew chapter 1 verse 5, whenever she's listed in the genealogy of Christ, you know how that she's listed there whenever she's put into the family of God? Rahab. Amen. In this room, there are many, many things that could be attached to before and after each and every one of our names. But because we have been placed in the family of God, when God looks at us, he doesn't see any of those things. Amen. Michelle fades off into obscurity. Rahab 
is in the genealogy of God, the Son in the flesh. I don't know where you're at this morning. But I feel like that I'm done. We could talk about where each of us started. But where do you want to finish? We saw two individuals that start in the same exact place. When we find them, they're letting people out through windows, saving their lives. But because of different choices, one of them ends up being nothing. One of them changes their lives. And now we know about a little Gentile girl thousands of years after she has been buried because of the love she had for her God. How do you want to end? All of us will. All of us will end. How do you want your children to remember you? How do you want your grandchildren to remember you? Michelle or Rahab?